Brushing your teeth keeps them clean and free from debris. But back in medieval times, dental hygiene wasn't part of your daily routine. This means that scientists can look at the teeth of skeletons to reconstruct what food they might have munched on back then and find out more about their lifestyle. But recently, a team of international scientists led from the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Jena, Germany, found something a little more peculiar fossilised in the teeth of a 1,000-year-old skeleton. Myself, Jenny Gracie, spoke with Christina Warriner to unearth the mysterious finding. What we found was something actually we never set out to find. It was something we found by accident. We were doing a study on dental calculus, which is this amazing kind of calcified plaque or tartar on your teeth. And we were actually doing this to investigate health and disease and diet. Um, But instead, what we found were these extraordinary, brilliant blue particles that we eventually learned were lapis lazuli. And many people may be familiar with this. It's a beautiful stone. Um, It's blue in color, but it also has kind of white components and it has pyrite in it, which are fool's gold, which gives us this kind of golden appearance. Now, this was a really important stone in prehistory and was used to adorn um, many ancient temples. Um, And in the medieval period, a technique was developed to convert the stone into a brilliant blue pigment. And, um, and so that's what we found was this, was this pigment. Who would have used it back then? So access to this would have been really limited. During the medieval period, there was only one known source of lapis lazuli, and that was mines from Afghanistan. All told, this pigment would have traveled about 6,000 kilometers from its origin point to the cemetery at, at Dalheim in, in Germany, where we identified it. Wow, that's quite the journey for it. How did you think it actually got into the teeth? So we evaluated multiple ways it could have gotten into the teeth. At first, uh, a bunch of us uh, scientists and historians sat around and just had a blue sky discussion of how could this possibly have happened. You know, we decided there were four scenarios that could have led to this, all possible but not equally plausible. The only thing we thought was really plausible, which was that she was an artist herself and had used this pigment. This powder is very fine and it gets in the air very easily. Um, And so through handling, she could have exposed her mouth to it. But what we think is probably the most likely point of entry is if she had used her lips to shape the brush. So this is very commonly done by artists today to kind of get a fine point for detailed work. And it's even described in medieval artist manuals, techniques for using the lips to shape the brush. And we think this is probably how it entered her mouth. How do you know that it wasn't another blue pigment that was used um, for scribing at the time? So there were a really limited number of blue pigments available to medieval artists. Almost all of them derive their blue color from a characteristic metal. So smalt, for example, is blue because of cobalt. Azurite is blue because of copper. Lazurite is the only one that doesn't have a distinctive metal um, that gives it the blue color. Rather, it's the actual mineral structure that imparts that rich blue. So we initially did elemental testing and we could show that it lacked cobalt and it lacked um, copper and iron and it had an elemental composition that was consistent with lazurite. We took this a step further and we used a different technology called Raman spectroscopy. This allowed us to actually examine the mineral structure of lazurite and make a positive match. What is the historical importance of this discovery? Well, I think one of the things that's really interesting is it comes from a period where we have very few surviving records. So later on in the 13th and 14th century, we start having many more records from these monasteries preserved. This is really early in this period, and we know very little about um, scribes and artists at this time, and especially very little about women scribes and artists from this time. So that makes it really exciting. Another thing is, you know, this is very early also for lapis lazuli to be distributed quite this far and even into these, this fairly remote region. This was a very small monastery. Even at its height, it probably only um, had about 12 to 14 women associated with it. And so the, the fact that it reached so far, even into these very small centers, was a big surprise. But we have very little records of trade at this time of artist materials. So this is a really important finding for historians of trade and and economics. And then also there's this important aspect of the fact that this was a woman who had this pigment. Um, I think it had been widely assumed that only people living in large cities or in major centers of artistic production would have had access to that and that it would have been really limited to use by male monks. And here we have a direct contradiction of that. Christina Warner, group leader of the project, and the paper was published in Science Advances.